All right, hey everybody, uh, welcome back. Today we're going to be talking um, about the actual muscles of the body that you need to learn. Um, so, and that's going to include some basics about like the shapes of the different muscles, how muscles work, so how they actually work to, to move your skeleton around, um, and how we name them. Because um, there are some tricks to naming them that are going to be uh, really helpful for you to remember their names so you don't just have to memorize them all. All right, so first of all, let's start by talking about um, where muscles begin and where they end, right? So we know that the ends of skeletal muscles tend to taper uh, into a tendon, right? And that tendon is going to be the accumulation of all of that uh, connective tissue, like the endomesium and the paramesium and the epimesium um, that's surrounding um, each layer of muscle. Um, so those tendons um, each are going to have an origin and an insertion. All right, so the origin, um, like you can see here in the um, in this uh, picture of the biceps. So this is you're looking at biceps in um, in a cadaver here. So they're calling this the insertion. This is the origin of the of the muscle. So the the muscle originates up here, um, and then we have the insertion of the muscle down at the other end. So um, every muscle's got an origin. That's where it starts, and an insertion is where it ends. All right. So the origin is usually going to be the stable point. The insertion is on the bone that's actually going to be moving. All right. So for my biceps brachii here, I'll show you my my biceps. Um, it originates up here on your shoulder, but it inserts down here on your radius. Let's get into the frame. So that when I flex my biceps, flexed, um, what that does is pull that radius closer. So it closes the angle of the joint here. Right? So it flexes the joint. So by flexing this muscle, by contracting that muscle, um, I'm pulling the radius closer um, to where the, the muscle originates. There. So origin is usually the stable point. Insertion is usually the point that's moving. All right, so for example, yeah, so this is just an example here. Biceps, um, your biceps um, has two tendons. That's why it's biceps. So it's got two origination points. Um, so it originates on the scapula, it inserts on the radius, um, and the action is mainly to flex the elbow. So flexion of the elbow means you're closing the angle of that joint. Um, so on the other side of the arm, so on the, the posterior aspect of the arm here, we've got the triceps. So triceps is also going to originate on the scapula, um, but it's going to insert on the ulna. Uh, and when your triceps flexes, so right now triceps is relaxed, when I flex it, um, it's going to extend the arm. So it, it straightens out that elbow. Right, so those two have opposite actions. Okay, so a lot of times when whenever we do movements, it's going to be more than just one muscle. So you have like roughly, depending on what you count as a, as a muscle, somewhere between four and 600 different muscles in your body. I'm not going to make you memorize them all, but we will have to know the big ones um, and understand that a lot of muscles work in groups. Uh, and when they work in groups, we usually have a prime mover. So prime mover, sometimes also called the agonist. He's the, like the lead muscle for doing whatever job that is. Um, and then along with that prime mover, there are usually some helper muscles that help to execute that movement. All right. Um, and on the opposite side, so if we have an agonist, we also could have an antagonist. So if, if my agonist for, um, for flexion of the elbow is biceps, then the antagonist is triceps. So biceps is the agonist for elbow flexion. Uh, the antagonist here for elbow extension would be the triceps brachii muscle. Okay, um, so since we have an agonist or like a prime mover, we also need synergists. So synergists are, are muscles, usually smaller muscles, that help out with that main action, right? So, so my, my biceps here flexes my elbow, but it's not the only muscle in there that's doing that job. So kind of right underneath it is another muscle called brachialis. So brachialis um, acts synergistically with biceps brachii to flex the elbow joint. All right, so um, let's go through a couple questions here before we continue on. So biceps brachii contracts to flex the arm, the, el the elbow. Um, this muscle is the prime mover. So if that biceps brachii is the prime mover, think about what the antagonist is and what the action of that antagonist is. We need to use the correct words here. 
Um, and then if the brachialis contracts to aid the biceps brachii, what term describes those two working together? So think about the answers to those. Okay, um, so the antagonist for biceps brachii is triceps brachii, right? Because it does the opposite movement and that opposite movement, the opposite of flexion is extension, right? And then as far as the muscles working together, so the brachialis is a synergist with biceps brachii for flexion of the elbow. All right, a little more terminology here. So um, what connects muscle to bone? What connects bone to bone? And then what, so if we know the answers to those two questions, what do I think would connect my quadriceps muscle to the patella? And what would connect the patella to my tibia? Right. Okay, so the first answer to the first one, what connects muscle to bone is a tendon. What connects bone to bone is a ligament. So in that case, then the quadriceps muscle, which is the muscle of the anterior thigh, um, the, the, what's connecting that quadriceps muscle to the patella or the kneecap is your quadriceps tendon, right? And then the patella is also connected to the tibia, but since patella and tibia are both bones, neither one is a muscle, then we call that the patellar ligament, right? So it's a continuation of the same structure. So that quadriceps tendon comes down over the knee, connects the quadriceps muscle to the patella, and then we've got the patella connecting to the tibia. Even though it's a continuation of the same structure, we're gonna give it different names because they, they have slightly different functions there. So tendons connecting muscle to bone and ligaments connecting bone to bone. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how we name muscles. Um, so we're gonna discuss a lot of muscles here and I, I want you to kind of use some basic rules of thumb to begin to remember what they're called. So for example, you're looking at the, the anterior surface of the leg there and that the muscle that's right there is tibialis anterior, right? So a lot of times we name the muscles just based on the location, right? So tibialis anterior is located on the anterior aspect of the tibia, right? So pretty, pretty easy to sort that one out. Um, sometimes we name the muscles for the number of attachments they have. So for example, I mentioned earlier that biceps has two origination tendons. Um, so that's biceps, bi means two. Um, your triceps has three. So there's three mus muscle bellies to your triceps. That means we call it tri for three. Um, gluteus maximus. So maximus means large, right? You also have gluteus medius and gluteus minimus. Um, and those are smaller than gluteus maximus. So sometimes we name them after size. Sometimes we name them after the number of attachments they have. Uh, sometimes after uh, the directionality of the muscle fibers. So remember that skeletal muscle fibers are these long parallel fibers, but they can go in different directions. Um, so the one that they're pointing out here is transverse abdominis. So transverse abdominis goes across the abdomen, but it goes in a transverse direction. So you can't see it because it's a very deep layer of muscle here, but it goes all the way across in the transverse direction. Uh, sometimes muscles are also named after um, their attachments, so where they originate and where they insert. So for example, the, the stylohyoid here, so stylohyoid, um, he's connecting uh, from the, trying to see him here, um, from the, the stylus process, styloid process, which is part of your temporal bone, all the way to the hyoid bone, which is in your neck there. So stylohyoid from the stylus process to the hyoid bone. Uh, and then sternocleidomastoid, that's a mouthful, but uh, we can kind of sort it out. So it goes from your sternum, right, all the way down here in the sternum, past your clavicle, which is clido, all the way up to the mastoid process of your temporal bone. So sternocleidomastoid goes all the way down here. So sternum, clavicle, mastoid process. All right, and then sometimes we name the muscles after the action that they do. So right here, you can see levator scapulae. So think about levator, think elevator to elevate something. So levator scapulae literally elevates your shoulders. It elevates the scapula. Um, then the next one here, adductor magnus. Adductor magnus isn't on this picture, um, but you can guess by the name of it that it's a large muscle that adducts something. And so the largest thing that we can really adduct is the thigh. Um, so the adductor magnus you find on the interior aspect of the thigh, so on the medial uh, side of the thigh. Uh, and then tensor tympani, so that one's kind of tricky. Um, it, you know, we can tell it tenses something, 
And tympani kind of sounds like a drum, right? So what this muscle does is actually tense the eardrum. Right? So, so a lot of these muscles are named kind of after what it is that they do. So we can kind of figure it out uh, by the, the sound of the name. Right, or sometimes there's combinations here. So, so for example, this guy here, fibularis longus, um, he goes along the side of the fibula and he's really long. So fibularis longus. Um, and then this guy, fibularis brevis, and brevis means brief or short. So fibularis longus is the longer one on the fibula. Fibularis brevis is the shorter one on the fibula. Okay, so that's the basics of how we name muscles. So, so if I give you a muscle name, most of them aren't just totally random. Um, you can actually kind of piece together what they do or where they are or, or the size or shape of them based on their name. Um, we also um, should briefly cover the idea of fascicle organization. So remember that fascicles are uh, bundles of muscle fibers, uh, and those bundles of muscle fibers can take on different shapes. Um, so this first one here, parallel, circle this one. Um, so for example, your biceps brachii, which we've been talking about, that's got a parallel muscle, fascicle, um, parallel fascicle organization. So all of the fascicles are kind of in a parallel formation. Um, your abdominal muscles are all parallel fascicles, so they're all kind of going in one direction. You also have some muscles that have a convergent uh, fascicle organization. So convergent means they kind of start out wide and then they narrow down to a point. Um, so this guy here, your, uh, your pectoralis, I'm really bad at this highlighter, um, your pectoralis is going to be a convergent organization. So it starts off kind of wide and flaring and then it, the tendon is a very narrow point. Um, we also have some circular muscles that are complete circles. Um, so these circular muscles um, you find, for example, around, you have a circular muscle that goes all the way around your eye. You've got another circular muscle that goes all the way around your lips. Um, and then pennate, pennate muscles, so there are a variety of types of pennate muscles, but they're basically all kind of look like a feather. So think pennate when you think feather organization. So if they look like a feather, then it's probably a pennate fascicle organization. Okay, all right, so now let's start getting into the actual muscles that you should be familiar with. All right, so we're just gonna start with the, start at the top, start with the head and then move our way down. So uh, first muscle here that we should be familiar with, and I think we've, we've even mentioned it before, is this guy, the occipito frontalis. So frontalis part is here, occipitalis talus part's back here on the back of your head, uh, and then they just connect through that epicranial aponeurosis. Um, so the job of occipito frontalis is basically to raise your eyebrows, um, so you can pull your eyebrows backwards using that muscle. Uh, the next one here, orbicularis oris, this one is the one that goes all the way around the mouth. So um, when you hear orbicularis, um, think orbit. So something that goes around something, orbits something. And then oris, think oral, like your mouth. Um, so orbicularis oris is good for um, moving your lips around, basically. So for speech and for kissing, you would use orbicularis oris. Um, some more muscles of the face here. So uh, buccinator. So buccinator is kind of a deep muscle. You can see it right in here. This is buccinator. Um, so he's a deep muscle of your cheeks. Uh, basically, this muscle allows you to kind of pull your cheeks inward. So if you kind of do that, like make a fish face, then you're using buccinator. So it's anything where you're kind of pulling um, the cheek muscles inward is buccinator. Um, we've also got zygomaticus here. So zygomaticus major is this guy, um, and he 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 originates on the zygomatic bone, right? So named after the bone that he originates on, and he comes down and inserts on the lips. Um, so when you flex him, he makes you smile. So zygomaticus major is the muscle used in smiling. All right, some more muscles of the face here. Um, so the ones that are on top of your eyelids um, that causes you to lift just the upper eye is levator palpebrae superioris. And I know that's a mouthful, but let's break it down again. So levator means to elevate. Palpebrae is a fancy word for your eyelids. So elevate the eye, eyelid. And then superioris means the top one. So lift the top eyelid is what levator palpebrae superioris does. Um, so he's just, he's only here on the, uh, on the, the um, upper lid of the eye. Um, you also have another orbicularis muscle here, and that's the orbicularis oculi. 
So orbicularis oculi goes all the way around the eyeball, um, and he's helpful for closing the eye. So levator palpebrae superioris opens the eyelid, orbicularis oculi closes the eyelid. All right, and then down here in the neck, we can see platysma. So platysma is gonna help depress the mandible. So depress means to pull down. So he helps open your mouth, essentially. All right, um, turning the head to the side, we can see a few more muscles over here. So temporalis um, originates on the temporal bone. So no surprise there. Um, he goes all the way down and inserts on the mandible. Um, and same as masseter here. So masseter also goes down and inserts on the mandible. Both of these guys' job is to close the mouth. So to, to elevate the jaw, close the jaw. Okay, so let's take a closer look at the eye. So you have um, each one of your eyeballs has six, uh, what we refer to as extraocular muscles. So the muscles around the outside of the eye, extraocular. Um, so in these, it seems like a lot, but they're pretty, they're named pretty simply. Um, so anytime you see um, a muscle that has the name rectus in it, rectus is going to mean straight. So any, any rectus muscle is a muscle that comes straight on. So your eye has uh, four rectus muscles, a superior rectus, which is up at the top of the eye, an inferior rectus, which is at the bottom, a lateral rectus, which is going to be towards the lateral side, and a medial rectus towards the medial side. So right, four different rectus muscles, and the lateral and medial just come on the side of your eyeball. The superior and inferior come on the top and the bottom of your eyeball. Um, and then in addition to those four rectus muscles, we've got two oblique. So oblique means at an angle. So you've got two oblique muscles that wrap around the eyeball at an angle. So we can kind of see the superior oblique up here at the top. You can kind of see it better in this bottom picture. So superior oblique that kind of wraps around uh, and then the inferior oblique, which also wraps around the bottom of the eye, right? So, so think about how when muscles flex, they shorten. And if the muscle is shortening, it's going to pull on whatever its insertion is. So for example, if I'm, if I'm look, talking about superior rectus and the superior rectus inserts on the top of my eyeball, if I flex that, it's gonna cause my eyeball to rotate upward, right? If I flex inferior rectus, it's gonna cause the eyeball to look downward. If I flex lateral rectus, I'll look to the side. If I flex medial rectus, I'll look towards the, the other side, right? So in the superior and inferior oblique, um, make your eyeball look at a diagonal. So looking off in a diagonal direction. All right, so each of these is going to be important um, to direct your eyes to look at, you know, hopefully what you're trying to see. Okay, so more muscles of the of the head here. So let's focus in on the tongue. Uh, so this word gloss, anytime you see glossus, it's going to be referring to the tongue. Um, and then the, um, the other parts of these words here, so genioglossus, styloglossus, hyoglossus, kind of give you a hint as to where um, where the muscle is originating, they all insert on the tongue. So the tongue is the thing that they're moving. Um, so this guy here, genioglossus. So genioglossus um, uh, originates on the mandible, so the front of the mandible down here. And when you flex him, that'll move your tongue downward and forward. So genioglossus moves the tongue down and forward. Styloglossus uh, inserts on the tongue, but originates on the styloid process. So that's so that's way back here. So styloid process kind of beneath your ear all the way down to the tongue here. So when you flex that one, he's going to pull the tongue upward and backward. Uh, and then hyoglossus um, inserts on the tongue originates on the hyoid bone. So hyoid bone is this bone down here in the neck. So when you when you flex hyoglossus, he's going to pull the tongue downward. Okay, some more muscles that we would find in the neck. Um, so we mentioned this one before, the sternocleidomastoid. Um, so sternocleidomastoid um, is a large muscle that, uh, in fact, if I turn my head here, you can see sternocleidomastoid. It comes all the way from the mastoid process of the temporal bone, all the way past the clavicle and then to the sternum, right? And so sternocleidomastoid, you have one on this side and one on this side, so you got two of them. Um, if you flex them both at the same time, um, that's going to flex your head. So if I contract both of my sternocleidomastoids at the same time, that causes the head to move downward. 
Um, these guys, if you flex one or the other, it causes you to turn your head. So if I'm just flexing this one over here, then I turn my head towards that way. If I'm just flexing this one, I'll turn my head to the other direction. All right, so that's sternocleidomastoid. Uh, associated with sternocleidomastoid are these smaller um, synergistic muscles called scalenes. So scalenes are just synergists to the SCM or sternocleidomastoid. All right, so moving down um, into the neck and shoulder region. Um, so here's a large muscle that's on the, the back of your neck and back of your shoulder um, called trapezius. So trapezius is a very important muscle for supporting your arm. Um, so it helps move the scapula up, so it can help raise your shoulder. Um, and it can also help pull it down because see some of these um, origination points are high. So those origination points would pull up. Some of the origination points are low down here. They would pull it down. Um, so if I flex both of my uh, trapezius at the same time, that's gonna extend my head or cause my head to go upward. All right, moving down uh, in the back a little bit further down, uh, we find latissimus dorsi. Um, so latissimus dorsi, these are your lats. Um, so lats you find on either side of your body. Um, they're, they have a few different jobs. So they can medially rotate the shoulders. Medially rotate, it means kind of turn it inward. Um, and we can also adduct the arm. So bring the arm inward and extend the arm, which means pull the arm backward a little bit. So the latissimus dorsi does all of those movements. All right, uh, rotating around to the anterior side of the abdomen here, um, we can see that you've got four layers of abdominal muscles. Um, and so these, these abdominal muscles are gonna be um, important for a lot of different things. They help you compress your abdomen, which is gonna be important for you know, things like sitting up, but also anything, anytime you depress your abdomen, um, you're gonna be changing pressures of things inside your body. So that's gonna be important for defecation, urination, childbirth, and even for, for some types of breathing, you're going to be using these abdominal muscles. All right, so the one that goes straight up and down is rectus abdominis. So straight up and down here is rectus abdominis. Um, the one that comes in at an angle on the outside, angle downward, is external oblique. Um, the next deepest one underneath that is going to be internal oblique, which we can't really see in this picture. Internal oblique um, instead of external obliques, which come down at an angle like this, internal obliques come up at an angle like this, um, but they are deep uh, muscles that are difficult to see here. And then the deepest layer of, of abdominal muscle is your transverse abdominus, and that's the one that just goes directly across in a horizontal layer. Okay, so talk about the muscles that we use for breathing. So these are gonna be really important muscles, obviously, to help you breathe. Um, the main one, the prime mover for breathing is gonna be your diaphragm. And this is kind of a, a weird angle we're looking at here. So let me orient you. This is the sternum, here's the vertebrae. So you're look, you're kind of, and here's the, the bottom ribs, right? So you're kind of looking up um, underneath someone's diaphragm. So we can see this diaphragm is this huge sheet of thin muscle that kind of, and we talked about this before, how it separates the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. So it's this huge sheet of muscle here that just kind of separates um, those two parts of the body. So that one's gonna be very important for breathing. So the diaphragm normally, and when it's relaxed, is kind of in this dome shape. Uh, and then when you flex it, when you contract it, it flattens out. So relaxed diaphragm, um, contracted diaphragm. When it's relaxed, you're exhaling. When it contracts, you're inhaling. All right. In addition to that, we've got intercostal muscles. So inter means between. Costal is going to be here referring to the ribs. So in between the rib muscles, um, you've got external intercostals, which are important for inspiration, means breathing in, and uh, internal intercostals, which are good for expiration, which means breathing out. All right. So the external intercostals go in between each one of your ribs. And when they flex, they actually pull your ribs up a little bit. And as they pull your ribs up, it's gonna make more room in your thoracic cavity for air so you can breathe in. The internal intercostals do the opposite. So they pull the ribs downward, which helps you exhale. Okay, so moving over to the shoulder. 
Um, so the main muscle of the shoulder up here is your deltoid. So the deltoid is important for arm abduction. So if I want to abduct my arm, pull it away from the body, I'm mostly going to be using the deltoid. Um, the pectoralis major, which is a chest muscle, uh, but, it, but it inserts on the arm, it inserts um, on the humerus. So that's going to be important for adducting the arm, so bringing the arm back to the midline and then medially rotating the shoulder, so rotating the shoulder forward. Okay, um, so now here's another view. Let me um, let me orient you a little bit. So, so you're looking down um, at the pelvis here. So here we can see the two pubic bones and the pubic symphysis. Back here we see a vertebra. Here's your sacrum, um, and then here are the iliac crests. So you're looking down at the pelvic floor. So your pelvic floor muscles. Um, the two main ones that we're going to mention here are the levator ani. So levator ani is composed of pubococcygeus and also uh, iliococcygeus. So, and, and you can kind of guess by the name of them that the pubococcygeus goes from the pubis bone to the coccyx, iliococcygeus goes from the ilium to the coccyx. So combination of all these muscles creates levator ani, which is basically your, your pelvic floor. So that's helping to hold all of your, um, all of your pelvic organs in place. All right, back up to the to the shoulder here a little bit. So we've got a lot of muscles involved in that pectoral girdle. Um, so remember when we talked about the, the shoulder joint, we mentioned that the humerus, um, the head of the humerus just sort of fits in that very shallow socket of the glenoid cavity um, of the scapula. Um, and then we had some ligaments that are kind of holding things in place, but it takes a lot of muscle as well in order to hold that joint in place. So lots of muscles involved there. So I already mentioned the deltoid, which is the, the shoulder muscle here that lets you abduct the arm. Um, we've also got serratus anterior. So let me point that guy out here. So serratus anterior, um, it's kind of these, these almost finger-like projections of muscle that sort of wrap down around your ribs um, toward the lateral aspect of your ribs. Um, and if you if we were to isolate them, this isn't a great picture, but if we were to isolate them, they would kind of look jaggedy like a serrated knife. So think serratus, think serrated. Um, also um, on the back of this model here, so we can see um, two rhomboid muscles, so rhomboid minor and then rhomboid major. Um, so those are going to be important for, for pulling your shoulders back, right? So they, they go from the scapula to the spine to help you pull your shoulders backward. Uh, and then pectoralis major and minor, we already mentioned pectoralis major, um, but beneath pectoralis major is pectoralis minor. So that's this guy here, pectoralis minor. So, and again, he's, he's going to be synergistic uh, with pectoralis major to, uh, to uh, adduct the arm. All right, a few more muscles involved in that rotator cuff, so, um, so moving the shoulder. Um, supraspinatus and infraspinatus. So let's look at those guys here. So supraspinatus and then infraspinatus. Now again, the names don't don't let them throw you. So supra means above, infra means below, and spinatus is referring to the spine of the scapula. So here's your scapular spine here, um, and I'll point it out up here as well. Scapular spine. Um, so supraspinatus is above the spine, infraspinatus is below the spine. So they just go from the scapula to the humerus and help to hold that, uh, hold that joint in place. Um, subscapularis is beneath the scapula. All right, so subscapularis, we can see part of it in this picture here, although this is not a great picture. He would be deep to the scapula, helping to hold that scapula in place. Uh, and then teres, uh, major and teres minor um, are kind of, um, let me see, yeah, you can see them in this picture a little bit better than me trying to point them out on my own body. Um, so there's teres major um, and then teres minor is associated with him as well. So again, these are all helping kind of ab abduct the arm or adduct the arm and hold that shoulder joint in place. Okay, um, muscles that move the forearm. So this is muscles that move the forearm. Um, so biceps brachii and brachialis we already mentioned. So your biceps brachii is, is the, the, the muscle here that's on your arm, but it's actually moving the forearm. Um, and then he's going to be synergistic with the brachialis. Uh, and then they are antagonists to triceps brachii. So triceps brachii is the one that's going to extend uh, the elbow and straighten out the arm. 
Okay, um, down into the forearm here, uh, we can see brachioradialis. So brachioradialis kind of starts up here on the humerus and goes all the way down here um, to the radial side of the, of the hand almost. Um, so he's going to be somewhat synergistic in flexion of the elbow, but also really important for, for supination and pronation of the forearm. So if I want to rotate my forearm in this direction, I'm going to be using brachioradialis to do that. Um, and then brachialis we already mentioned in the last slide. Okay, so a few more muscles of the, the forearm here. So the anterior forearm, um, so we're looking at the anterior side of the forearm here. Um, so we've got flexor muscles here. So the, all of the muscles on the anterior side of the forearm here are going to flex the wrist. So they're going to pull the wrist forward, flex the wrist. So a lot of them just have flexor in the name. So flexor carpi flex the wrist on the radius side, on, so on the radial side of the, of the arm, is flexor carpi radialis. Um, flexor carpi ulnaris is on the ulnar side. Um, and then we also have palmaris longus. So palmaris longus goes all the way up into the palm of the hand. So that's why it's palmaris and it's very long, right? So all of those three muscles together are synergists for, for uh, flexion of the carpus or flexion of the wrist. All right. On the dorsal aspect of the arm on the posterior side, then we've got a whole bunch of extensor muscles. So those guys are going to extend the wrist backwards. Um, so again, extensor carpi radialis on the radial side, extensor carpi ulnaris on the ulnar side, and then extensor digitorum, which goes all the way up to the fingers here. So that's going to help you do this kind of wrist extension movement. All right. So looking at intrinsic muscles of the hand. So your hand, um, surprisingly, a lot of the muscles that you use in your hand are actually in your forearm. So your forearm controls a lot of hand motions. We don't have too, too many muscles that are actually intrinsic to the hand. So intrinsic means they both start and end in the hand. Um, most of your hand muscles are extrinsic, which means they may end in the hand, but they originate on the forearm. Um, but the few that you do have in the hand are the thenar. Uh, and the hypothenar. So thenar is going to be on the thumb side here, hypothenar on the pinky side of the hand, uh, and then flexor and extensor pollicis. So that's going to flex and extend the thumb. So if I, if I extend the thumb, I'm doing that. If I flex the thumb, I'm doing that. So flexor and extensor pollicis help with that movement. Um, and then adductor and abductor pollicis do this, just in and out like that. All right, so moving down into the leg, um, muscles that move the thigh. So uh, the main muscles that move the thigh are going to be your gluteus muscles. So these are going to be um, uh, important in extending the hip. These are hip extensors. Um, so gluteus maximus is the large one um, that's going to extend the hip and, and also can laterally rotate the hip. Um, and he's going, to, um, he's going to work with these other two muscles. So gluteus medius. Uh, and gluteus minimus are important for hip abduction, so pulling the hip kind of away, medially rotating it away. Okay, um, moving into the kind of anterior thigh a little bit here. I know this, this picture looks a little bit confusing. Let me orient you. So here's your iliac crest. Here's your sacrum. Uh, here's the knee, All right? So we're looking at um, the muscles of the hip and the thigh. So starting off at the top here, let's look at iliopsoas. So iliopsoas is a combination of two muscles, uh, and those, those two muscles are iliacus and psoas major. So those two kind of come together to form this iliopsoas, um, and, and he is important for hip flexion. So he's going to help you flex the hip muscles. So if, if we're talking about hip flexors, um, you're probably talking about iliopsoas. Over on the side here, lateral side of the leg, we've got this kind of long muscle that comes all the way down the side here. That's tensor fascia latte. Um, tensor fascia latte is going to abduct your hip. So it's going to be pulling your legs away from you. So pull the legs away from the body. Um, and then on the anterior aspect of the thigh, we've got your quadriceps. So quadriceps is a name for this group of four different muscles. Um, that are going to be important for knee extension. So that's what your quadriceps do. They extend the knee, right? So, and we're going to start off with the one, the, the top one here is rectus femoris. So again, rectus means a straight muscle. So rectus femoris is the one on top. And then you've got 
three different vastus muscles. So we've got vastus lateralis, which is on the lateral side, vastus medialis, which is on the medial side or the inside of the thigh, uh, and then vastus intermedius, which is directly deep to rectus femoris. So you can't really see it in this picture, but it would be directly underneath rectus femoris. Uh, and then this kind of guy coming in on an angle here. So starting at the iliac crest and then wrapping around to the interior thigh is called sartorius. So sartorius is going to be important for lateral rotation of the leg um, and abducting the hip. Okay. Um, so now we're looking around at the backside of the leg, so posterior aspect of the thigh here. Um, so we can see um, the gluteus maximus has been cut away here so that we can see kind of what's underneath it. So normally there would be a large gluteus maximus muscle um, up top here, but it's been cut away. Um, the, the muscles that flex your knee, um, so these are antagonists of your quadriceps, these are hamstrings. Okay, so hamstrings are composed of three different muscles. So semitendinosus, which is this guy here, semimembranosus, which kind of splits and goes on either side of semitendinosus, but is deep to him, uh, and then biceps femoris. So biceps femoris is on your, on your femur. And so the three of those muscles together are your hamstrings, and hamstrings are important for flexing the knee or bending that knee joint. Um, on the inside aspect of the thigh, we've also got some adductor muscles. So remember, adduct is to bring towards the midline. So we've got adductor magnus, adductor longus, and adductor brevis are these muscles here that are, that are on the medial aspect of the thigh, and those are gonna bring the legs together. All right, um, down into the leg. So uh, leg muscles, uh, the big one on the, the anterior surface is tibialis anterior. So tibialis anterior just runs along the anterior aspect of the tibia. Um, and then um, on, on this anterior aspect of the leg, we're going to have extensor muscles. So just like you had extensor muscles on the anterior, or uh, well, that's a lie. That's the posterior aspect of your arm. Um, but the, we're going to extend the feet here. So act, extensor halysis, you can guess by the name, is something that's going to extend the big toe, right? So it's going to extend the halix. Um, extensor digitorum, that's going to extend all the other toes, so that's down here, um, all the little tendons that are going into these digits. Um, and then fibularis longus, we already mentioned, is that long muscle on the fibula side, so that's going to be important for eversion of the foot. Okay, and then turning around to the back side of the leg here, um, so you're looking at your calf muscles. Uh, calf muscles, there's two main muscles of your calf here. Those are gastrocnemius and soleus. Um, so, so these are the, the large muscles on the, the posterior side of the leg. So gastrocnemius and soleus. Um, those two muscles kind of merge together to form one large tendon back here. And that large tendon is your Achilles tendon. So that, that is attaching gastrocnemius and soleus all the way down to the calcaneus bone of the foot here. Sometimes that tendon is, is just called the calcaneal tendon instead of the Achilles tendon, but um, you should know both terms for it. All right, so I know that was a lot of muscles. Take your time going through those. Uh, let me know if you have any questions.